Hello, you are watching Practical 3D Modeling in Blender, the series in which we take a look at the tools and features that are available by default in Blender 2.9, while also showing their practical application and usage in a given 3D modeling project. In the last video, I challenged you to go out and find an item that you wanted to create one for one in 3D. And in this video, I'll give you a quick overview of your basic poly editing tools that are available in Blender, and then show you how to start setting up your scene to prepare for the 3D modeling process. So let's start talking about the basic editing tools that you probably already know, and hopefully cover some features that maybe you weren't aware of. So I have a new scene and I've imported a torus, which I'm going to use as an example. So I'm going to select an area of faces here, and we probably already know about things such as extrude by tapping E on the keyboard and inset by tapping I. Okay, good. Now, it's important to know that when you extrude an area of faces like this by tapping E, it's extruding those faces on the calculated average of the normals of all the faces that we have selected. So if I go into my overlay options and I hit this checkbox on the faces of the normals, you can see it's extruding these faces at this little pole angle here. So as you can see, if I change my transform orientation from normal to global, and we'll talk more about this later, and I extrude this area of faces again, I'm gonna tap Z, and now it's constrained to the Z axis on the global world space, as opposed to extruding it on the Z axis of the normals. Now, likewise, if I just go back a few steps here, we have the option to extrude an area along the pole direction of the face normal. So if we hit Alt E on our keyboard, we see we have the option extrude faces along normals. And if we hit that, you can see that this is actually a very different effect as opposed to the default extrude. All of these faces have extruded and scaled along the face normal, is where we only did a default extrusion of faces on this section. And this modification applies to other transformations in Blender as well. So if I go over here and I select a face and I press S on the keyboard, this is our default scaling effect. Now if I click on another face over here and I'm going to hit Alt S, it's scaling it along the face normal. Now, if you go over here and we're gonna select an area of faces, you probably already know you can tap I on the keyboard to inset an area of faces. Now you can also tap I, then hold control, and you can raise or inset that area of faces into the object that you're working on. In addition, you can also select an area of faces, tap I on the keyboard to inset, and then tap I again, and you will inset each face individually. Okay, so maybe we're not looking to inset this area of faces. Instead, we want to offset an edge loop around this selection because we have other plans for what we're gonna do with this area of geometry. So if we tap I for inset and then we tap O, instead of scaling inward the faces that we have selected, we're dragging off an edge loop around our selected area without changing the scale of the area that we selected. So now if we accept that and we tap I again and tap I to inset individual faces, we now have a supporting edge loop around the area we just created this inset. So then I could do something weird to this area like hit Alt-E on the keyboard and extrude faces along normals, extrude them inward once, hit Alt E again, extrude faces along normal, extrude them more inward, and then say if I added a subdivision surface modifier and crank that up a little bit. Next, we'll use this little cube to start talking about bevel. Now, pretty much all of us probably know about bevel already because it's one of the most used tools that you'll probably employ during your 3D modeling process, but there's a bunch of other little features that you might not be aware of that are really helpful to know about. Okay, so let's talk about what everybody probably already knows. Select a face, 
hit Control-B, and you create a bevel. You can drag in or only drag out slightly for a tight bevel, drag out far for a really wide bevel. You can roll your mouse wheel up and down to create new segments. Press P on your keyboard to adjust the shape profile of your bevel. Drag all the way out for a perfect 90 degree angle with supporting edge loops. Or you can drag it all the way inward to create this sort of inset recessed edge around your top face. Once you click off confirming your beveled options, you still have controls to change anything before you go on editing in this little bevel menu. If it doesn't pop up here, then it's just collapsed down here below. Hit the arrow to see your bevel options. The default bevel when you start in Blender is usually set to 0.5. Now, beveling a single face like this is generally a safe transform, meaning that all the faces that we have just created are quads, meaning every face has only four vertices. And every other face on our cube that wasn't edited still retains four vertices. However, if we were to press two on the keyboard to go into edge select mode and bevel only a single face, then the new face that we created is a quad with only four vertices, but you can see that we also created two faces on each side of the cube that now have five vertices. This is called an n-gon, which, which is any face that has more than four vertices. Now, generally speaking, n-gons are not good for your 3D modeling process, but they're not as evil as everybody makes them sound. My doctrine when it comes to n-gons is as long as they are completely flat, surrounded by a border of quadded topology, and as long as Blender can easily solve them with a triangulation modifier, then they're allowed to hang around on my model as long as they want. So be aware of that whenever you bevel an edge. Now, if I go back and I press one on the keyboard to go into vertex select mode, I'm gonna select one vertice and I'm gonna hit control B. Now, nothing's happening until we press V on the keyboard and now we are beveling a single vertex, which creates this triangle. Furthermore, if we go back to edge select mode, we select an edge, hit control B, tap V, now we're just individually beveling both vertices that were selected on that edge. Now you can still roll your mouse wheel to further divide that triangle, and you can also change the shape profile. But as you can see, some weird things will happen when we start doing that. Now if we confirm, just be aware that we have created some pretty large end guns on multiple faces of our cube. Another thing to quickly mention is that if we select these two opposing edges right here and we hit Control B, as we bevel and we keep dragging out, eventually we might get to a point where both those beveled edges start crossing over each other. And that's gonna create some really weird effects on our geometry. So if you don't want this happening where any of your beveling is intersecting and overlapping with each other when you bevel, then just tap C to clamp the overlap. And that will stop that beveled edge once it meets with another edge. And that is just a quick overview of the basic modeling tools in Blender, covering all the features that I use routinely whenever I'm 3D modeling. Okay, so jumping into our 3D project, let's talk about a few things that you should set up before you start your 3D modeling process. One is to find good scale reference data for the item you're trying to create. In my case, I looked up the dimensions of the camera that I was going to be making, and then I created a basic cube, and then I typed in the scale dimension values in the item panel. Next, I did an image search, and I found a front-facing photo and a top-facing photo of the camera that I'm looking to create. I dropped those into my scene, and then I matched them up to the scale reference cube that I've created. Now, I'm going to be using these photos as reference for the scale and positioning of most items and details on the camera, but I'm not looking to match my modeling one-to-one -to, -one to these photos. In fact, that's probably not a good idea, as these photos still have some perspective distortion that you have to take into consideration. It would be much better to work from something like a schematic drawing or a blueprint that's essentially an orthographic drawing of the item. However, I'll be able to make do and adjust accordingly using these photos. And with this setup, I'll get started blocking out the basic shapes of the camera 
using the scale dimension cube that I created. Now, this is something that takes a lot of time and practice, but eventually you'll be able to quickly visualize an object and understand the series of steps and operations that you need to go through in order to accurately recreate it. One thing that you'll see me do quite often is that I will duplicate or split off faces to create a new part of the object I'm working on. I find this to be a lot faster than constantly generating new meshes, scaling them down, and then deleting the parts that I don't need. If I'm looking to create any part that has any similarities to the shape, scale, or geometry of something that I've already created, then I'll simply borrow from the existing object. For a lot of my early modeling, I'll be focused on working with only flat shapes and cutting out the forms of what I'm trying to create. And later on, I can extrude or solidify them to give them depth. For my previous weapon design projects, I actually did most of the initial modeling by simply cutting out the major shapes with a single plane, and then later gave them depth by using a solidify modifier. Likewise, whenever you're working on 3D modeling, it's important to go into your shader options and make sure that you have back face calling enabled. This way you know which way your geometry is facing. So this covers our basic poly modeling tools and what you need to know about setting up your workspace in Blender for 3D modeling. In the next video, we are going to start talking about transform orientation and transform pivot point and their application to 3D modeling. So I hope you found this video useful and I'll see you in the next one.